Welcome to Lowell Ghost Goths and Ghouls, an audio tour. The first modern serial killer to be accurately profiled was once a Freemason here in Lowell. His name was J. Frank Hickey. People described him as a mild, intelligent man and a bit of a dandy, but when he got a hold of a whiskey bottle, he would lose his head and do terrible things. Born in Lowell in 1854 and raised in the Acre, Hickey had had a difficult childhood. His father, a bootmaker, physically abused him and once had tried to kill him in a violent attack. Both of his parents died by the time Hickey was 12 and, along with his brother, went to live with their stepmother. As a boy, he picked up a lifelong habit of stealing. At 15, Hickey was expelled from Lowell High School and convicted of petty larceny for stealing other students' clothes from dressing rooms. In 1883, when he was 18, Hickey had a job working at McKibben's Drug Store, which was located at the intersection of Market and Suffolk Street, where a convenience store now stands. It was here that he would kill for the first time. Hickey was the only employee, so when the owner, Mr. McGibbon, went on vacation, he brought in a temporary worker to help pick up the slack. The man's name was Edward Morey, a 34-year-old former apothecary who'd fallen on hard times due to his alcoholism. Lowell was a dry town at the time, but alcohol was still sold for medicinal purposes at local pharmacies. So when Morey moved to Lowell, he took to hanging around the shops to wrangle drinks. Morey got to know McGibbon, and it even helped him out when he got sick, so the pharmacist was generous with his liquor supply. When Maury came on board for the temporary gig, he felt free to help himself. One day, when they were working together, Hickey briefly left the shop and returned to find Morley collapsed on the floor behind the counter. He called the police, who arrived with a physician. Attempts to save Maury were unsuccessful, and he was pronounced dead due to apoplexy caused by opium poisoning. Because of his history, the death was assumed to be an accidental overdose and was never fully investigated. Hickey would later confess to killing Maury, although he claimed it had been an accident. He said that he had dosed Maury's liquor bottle with a small amount of laudanum, just enough to make him sick, and so, Hickey claimed, dissuade him from continuing his habit. In a 2006 book about Hickey, The Postcard Killer, Author Vance McLaughlin writes that Hickey may have wanted to get rid of Maury out of fear that the more experienced apothecary would take his job. But whether or not he meant to kill Maury, Hickey would later say that the guilt over his death led him into alcoholism and murder. Soon after this incident, Hickey got a job as a clerk and stole money from his employer. Then he moved on to a new job at the YMCA where he stole 20 gallons of alcohol. He married Edith Lees, the daughter of a Lowell machinist, and had a son. Three years later, Edith filed for divorce due to Hickey's drinking. While all this was going on, Hickey also became a Freemason. He rose to the level of Master Freemason, but not the high rank of 32nd degree as he would later claim. After the whole stealing large amounts of alcohol thing, he got booted from the order as a liar and profane. The next year, he left Lowell. He never lived in the city again, although he was known to return for visits. As the Lowell son would later put it, Hickey left town with a bad reputation, but no one suspected he was capable of killing. Hickey drifted for the next six years before arriving in New York City in 1896. There he committed his first confirmed murder. He lured an 11-year-old newsboy named Michael Crook into Central Park and strangled him. Nine years later, he killed another child, seven-year-old Joey Joseph, and hid his body. And then he started sending postcards. He mailed them to the, to the police and to Joey's parents. Flipping between describing the scene, expressing remorse, and providing clues to the whereabouts of the child's body, one of the cards taunted, catch me if you can. The case became a media sensation, leading a young psychiatrist named Nelson Wilson to publish a detailed description of the person who could commit such a heinous crime, essentially the first serial killer profile. It was considered so accurate that Wilson was later hired by the prosecution. After the police decided to publish the postcards in the newspaper, Hickey's handwriting was recognized and he was arrested at an inebriate asylum in New Jersey, where he sometimes went to get sober. He was suspected of at least 12 additional murders, including that of a young Lowell boy named Arthur Dent, who disappeared near Lowell's Little Canada in 1900, but he only confessed to killing Joseph, Crook, and Maury. At the time of his arrest in 1912, District Attorney Wesley Dudley said in the Lowell Sun, Hickey apparently is a man with a dual personality. 
He is now overcome with remorse and says again and again that he cannot comprehend what possessed him to commit the crimes. He asserts that he became a maniac only when filled with whiskey. Hickey's lawyer pushed an insanity plea, and multiple psychiatrists were called in to argue both sides. After days of deliberations, the jury settled on a compromise, second-degree murder, which carried a 20 years to life sentence, rather than the death penalty. According to a news report at that time, most members of the public believed that a degenerate fiend has escaped merited punishment. Another paper quoted Hickey as saying that after the verdict, I ought to be electrocuted. I do murder and forget all about it in five minutes. He died in a prison of a brain hemorrhage in 1922. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down when i hear that trumpet sound i'm gonna rise right out of the ground ain't no grave can hold my body down sneak into a theater late at night and you might find the only source of light is a single bulb uncovered on a tall stand at center stage it's called a ghost light there are practical reasons for it, sure. You don't want anyone falling off the stage or crashing into the scenery. But theater people are a superstitious bunch, and they believe that most, if not all, theaters are haunted. The ghost light wards off evil spirits by fooling them into thinking the building is still occupied. Also, it's bad luck and bad business for a theater to be dark, meaning without a show. Leaving a ghost light on is a way of making sure the house is always lit. A tradition still followed at the Luna Theater in Mill No. 5, a location drenched in historic Lowell atmosphere. To see it, just walk down the mill's long hallway to the theater lobby and look up. The Merrimack Repertory Theater has its own ghost light, and the people who work there and in the adjacent Lowell Memorial Auditorium have good reason to keep it on. On a recent summer day, box office workers were spooked by the sounds of laughing little girls. To calm their fears, two other staff members did a thorough investigation of both buildings and heard the laughter themselves several times. The men thought someone was messing with them, so they triggered an alarm to catch the intruders. The laughter continued, but the alarm never went off. Lights in the building often go on that shouldn't. Visiting performers often opt not to use the dressing rooms in the basement because of the bad vibes. They and many who work there have been convinced that the theater is haunted. So what do we know about the location? Centuries ago, Native Americans built a village on the site to take advantage of the confluence of the Concord and Merrimack rivers. Later, Massachusetts mills built boarding houses here for its workers. As the mills declined, companies sold off their tenements. Around 1900, a mysterious businessman named Samen Cirque swooped into town and started buying them up. In one of Lowell's first gentrification projects, he fixed up the buildings and jacked up rents. Many tenants were forced to move out. Perhaps this history is behind two full-bodied apparitions that have been seen at the MRT. There's a back stairway near the stage that's used only by staff and performers. People have described feeling drastic temperature changes near this area and seeing a dark figure sitting nearby, watching. A staff member recently recalled an incident that occurred when he was working late with a student helper. In the basement, they saw a thin young woman with shoulder-length dark hair wearing a white dress walk past. She seemed headed for the costume shop. She looked enough like a woman who worked in the box office that at first they thought nothing of it, but then they realized that the box office was closed that day, and it was late enough that they were fairly sure that they were the only people in the building. The staff member went to look, but there was nobody there. The costume shop door was firmly locked. During a recent production, this staff member heard the scenic designer say that he would finish his work in the morning because he didn't want to stay in the building alone with the ghosts. The staffer asked him about the ghosts he'd seen, and he said that a slender, dark-haired young woman in a white dress had watched him for a moment before passing on and heading downstairs. Neither the staffer nor the designer had previously discussed the experience. They both chuckled, but before they left, they made sure to turn on the ghost light. Down the river, what do you think I see? I see a band of angels and they're coming after me. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Well, look down yonder, Gabriel. 
Put your feet on the land and see But Gabriel, don't you blow your trumpet Till you hear from me Ain't no grave can hold my body down Ain't no grave can hold my body down Well, meet me, Jesus, meet me Meet me in the middle of the air And if these wings don't fail me I'll meet you anywhere Ain't no grave can hold my body down Ain't no grave can hold my body down Well, meet me, mother and father Meet me down the river road And mama, you know I'll be there when I check my load Ain't no grave can hold my body down Ain't no grave can hold my body down Ain't no grave can hold my body down